Welcome, everybody. My name is Gerardo Estavo. I'm a solution architect from the Sydney office. I am Venezuelan, and I am thrilled to be here. In software as a service, speed is everything. And one big part of delivering that speed is giving developers the ability to ship great features fast to your users. Um, and they can only achieve that if they get to focus on building those features as opposed to getting caught in operational madness. Um, and while speed is what we want, we always need to pay particular attention to security. And this is especially important with multi-tenant SaaS applications because you're pooling all of your users' data together then you need to make sure identity is properly isolated and that you have implemented data partitioning. Yet, you don't want these security implementations to slow developers down or make things hard for them. Just like in downhill mountain biking, your main objective is speed, but you don't want to compromise in security. So today, we're going to crack open the IDE and we're going to transform a SaaS application that is currently comprised by a multiple uh, single tenant monoliths um, into a multi tenant SaaS application that is going to be uh, scalable, efficient, but more, most importantly, is going to allow our developers to focus a lot more on building features as opposed to maintaining stuff. You've signed up for a level 400 session, and I plan to show you a lot of things. So if you get lost in a couple of things or two, don't worry, you can rewatch the session on YouTube. And at the end of today, I'm going to give you the source code so that you can look at everything that I did and you can try it at home. So let's get started. The sample app for today is uh, Deck of Cards as a Service. It is an online service that I just came up with that allows you to create uh, virtual decks of cards, allows you to get those decks, shuffle the decks, and play very simple two card games. Not rocket science, but this will work for us to migrate it. Um, now, um, this imaginary business has hundreds of customers and it's growing, yet we have a few issues. And the two issues are around two key themes, around um, um, speed, meaning our competitors are going faster than us and our users want more features faster. Uh, and the other one is around efficiency with time and money. So the time that our developers are spending um, on building features is not as much as what they're spending on managing stuff. And also, we're spending money on underutilized infrastructure. So those are the two key themes, the speed and efficiency. And as the imaginary lead developer of this business, this is not my fault. Well, maybe it's a little bit my fault, and let me show you why. Um, so we started with a, a standardized code base, but then we started just saying yes to users too many times, and we ended up with building bespoke features for each user, and ended up with hundreds of code bases, both front-end and back-end. And this creates significant overhead for our developers when they want to manage source control, but it also means that we're making partial releases. Um, when we want to release something to users, we maybe release it to one, two, or maybe a handful. And when we do so, we make the code bases even more inconsistent. And to top it all off, <laughs> we have ma a manual sign-off process, meaning our engineers come up with new source code every time that we have a new user. This is not great. Now, on the infrastructure side, it's pretty similar. Uh, we have dedicated infrastructure per customer on Amazon EC2 and DynamoDB. Uh, and although we started with a few standardized builds, things have, have grown organically and we've been a bit poor in managing configuration change. And as a result, we ended up with hundreds of monoliths that are hard to scale. Um, those partial releases that I mentioned about are difficult and prone to error because we sometimes don't know what's inside those monoliths. And we're wasting time managing all these monoliths, wasting money paying for all of that infrastructure, even if users are using it or not. And obviously, man man manually provisioning environments, which takes a lot of time from our engineers. In summary, our technology cho choices, like the technology choices we've made over time, are slowing us down. We're not delivering a great SaaS experience to our users, and our developers are also feeling pretty miserable. <laughs> so the good thing is that we're going to change this today. Uh, and the way we're going to change it is by radically changing our architecture with the main goal of simplifying operations so that developers can refocus their time into what really matters, which is building and shipping those features faster. So we're going to do that in a couple of steps. We have four demos today. Um, the first thing we'll do is implement a self-service sign-up uh, and, and sign-in um, so that we can stop spending engineering time onboarding new customers. The, then we're going to move to a multi-tenant SaaS application in which we're consolidating all the customer code bases, both front-end and back-end. We're going to get the 
take the best versions of them. Uh, we're building everything into a centralized multi-tenant infrastructure with identity properly, uh, security guardrails around it. Um, and inside this uh, multi-tenant application or infrastructure, we're going to have serverless microservices. Serverless, because it's really cool, <laughs> and because we don't want to spend time, engineering time, on managing infrastructure. And microservices, because as some of you may be familiar with, when you package your software components into small and independent units, then application development becomes faster, and it, all, it is also faster to scale. And so let me show you what the end goal looks like. We want all of our customers accessing the same source code in the same S3 bucket. We want them hitting the same API. Um, we want to build a security kind of scaffolding around it um, that every customer is going to benefit from. And then we can have our developers start launching as many services as, as they want that are going to be accessed by all of the customers. Now, of course, we're going to create plans so that we can give our users choice in terms of what features they have available or not. But in terms of code, and infrastructure, everything's going to be multi-tenant. This is going to be much easier to, <laughs> to manage, and it's going to free up a lot of engineering time from our, our developers. So where do we start? I'm going to suggest we start with identity, because identity is a central piece in multi-tenancy. Um, and at the moment, we have little to no functionality in identity, because the code, there's dedicated code and dedicated infrastructure for each customer, so you don't actually need to worry about other, much about security. Yet we have some implementations. Please don't judge me, but what we have is basic auth uh, for authentication, which means we're embedding the uh, credentials for authentication into the authorization header of the HTTP request. Um, this is not secure. Um, I mean, it's somewhat secure, but it's vulnerable to dictionary attacks and things like that. And it also means we're transferring the credentials of the wire every single time, and there's no stage management in the back end. So uh, not, a, not very efficient. Now, on the, on the back end side of things, we're storing those credentials in Amazon DynamoDB. Um, and although DynamoDB now is encrypted at rest by default, the credentials themselves are stored in plain text. So anyone with rightful access to the database can access those credentials. That's obviously not secure. Now, in my defense, I can see they're hashing the credentials, but then they will still be vulnerable to dictionary attack and rainbow tables. I've considered salt hashing the credentials, but then I'm still transferring, transferring the credentials over the wire, which is not optimal. So after looking it up, it seems like the best way to do this is, going, is configuring remote password protocol, which is a workflow. And it's not that easy to implement. And I'm only talking here about password handling. I haven't started talking about uh, user workflows like sign up and sign in and what happens if the user forget the password, et cetera. So obviously, I'm gonna, I, want the, I want speed for my developers. And I wanna, for that reason, I'm going to use a managed service. For, of course, I'm talking about cognito user pools, a scalable user directory that grows to hundreds of millions of uh, users. Um, it'll do the secure password handling for me. But it's also built on standards, meaning that I can, I can rest assured that this is actually secure. There's a lot of compliance uh, that Cognito is compliant to. And the most important thing for this session is I can leverage built-in customizable web UI and all of those user flows so that my developers don't have to focus on it. So this is roughly how Cognito at very high level works. And you can customize a lot of it, but this is the basic flow. When you register single API call to Cognito, um, it sends you a challenge. If you respond to the challenge correctly, then you have successfully registered. Um, after that, you may want to sign in, and then you send another API call uh, that is using uh, that. And if you successfully signed in, then you get back some JWT tokens. Now, a couple of things on this slide. First, because you're using a managed service, all these calls from your front end are simple methods using the AWS SDK. So you don't need to worry about uh, all the smarts that go behind the, the, the service. And now these JWT tokens, um, I, I call them sometimes JWT, I sometimes say JWT tokens, but those are JSON, uh, web, uh, JSON web tokens, which are cryptographically verified JSON claims that cannot be altered. And these are going to be really important for this session, because every time that you make a request against the backend, you send those tokens, and then the backend can know who you are and get a lot of context from you. Now, there are three main types of uh, JAW tokens, access token and refresh token, both of which are heavily used by Cognito to maintain sessions, but we don't generally touch those. And there's a third one called identity token, 
which is, we're actually gonna work a lot on that. And let me show you how does it look inside. So um, the, this identity token, or any token for that matter, are comprised by three uh, parts that are 64 base encoded and concatenated by a dot. The first part uh, is a header that contains a pointer, a pointer to the key used to sign the algorithm, uh, to sign the token, sorry, and then also the algorithm that was used to sign the token. In the payload, you have multiple clamps, and you can have as many as you want. So think about multi-tenant. Think about when, you, when you're building services for multi-tenant, you want to get awareness of tenant, or think tenant context in all of those microservices. So this is a light way and secure way in which you can pass that information to any of your microservices. And that's also part of the reason why we're using a, an OpenID Connect uh, identity provider like Cognito. Now, in the signature there, it is just to verify that this token actually comes from where it says it's coming from, from the identity provider that we're defining in the payload. Now, we're gonna use this context when moving to multi-tenant. But the, the key here is that uh, OpenID Connect uh, providers allow you to embed as many claims as you want, and that's really good for SaaS applications because we, we can pass to downstream services all the claims and all the information that we want. Okay, enough talk. So we're gonna go for demo one. In demo one, what we'll do, we'll do two things. We'll, are gonna, we're gonna create a multi-tenant version of our front-end app, uh, and we're also gonna create the Cognito user pools, uh, and we'll do that using AWS Amplify, I don't know, the Amplify framework. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it basically comprised by three things. A library that allows you to choose cloud services and easily connect them to your app. A powerful tool chain, or a CLI, that allows you to easily create serverless backends um, and maintain that from your CLI. So I'm gonna create use, uh, the user pool using that CLI. And finally, you can accelerate application development when you use all these components so you don't have to create them. So let's do this. Boom. All right, so let me show you first what I have. So these are the, these are, I'm gonna show you two of the customers that have their dedicated uh, environments. So customer one, as you can see, I am a fantastic React developer with beautiful UI. I spent so much time on this, you can't believe. Um, so it allows you to create a deck, <laughs> um, to retrieve the deck, to play a game, which is basically dealing those games and keeping scores. And obviously there's no much point of dealing a perfectly ordered deck, so you can also shuffle the deck. So that's customer one. Customer two has a little bit less functionality so one less feature that they get access to. So they don't get access to shuffle, which makes this, oh, I made, I made the request incorrectly, which actually makes this um, um, pretty nonsensical. Because <laughs> if, if you can't shuffle the deck, then what's the point of actually playing this guy? So you can only get a perfectly ordered deck, and then deal, and that's it. <laughs> anyway, we use that too, so that they can upgrade to the new service later on. All right, so I have my code bases here. You can inspect that later on um, for customer one and customer two, both front end and back end. Um, so I'm gonna take customer one's version of the front end application because they have access to most of the features and I'm gonna standardize on that for my new multi-tenant code base that I'll be creating. So what I'm gonna be doing here is I am just copying the, the entire thing into a new folder called uh, multi-tenant app. Uh, within here I need to make a few changes. So this is a React app, so I actually need to tell it what domain is this gonna be pointing to. So that's a domain name with my last name on it. Um, and there's one more thing. So you notice how here I identify what customer is it. I actually wanna identify uh, whenever we get into this app, I want it to show me something else. So for example, welcome to new app. Happy face, why not? All right. So I'm gonna standardize on this code base, and now I'm gonna create Cognito user pools and then embed that into my application. So for that, I'm gonna use Amplify, as I said. So I'm gonna run three commands, and then I'll show you where I, where I got these commands from. So amplifying it is basically initializing Amplify in your local project. That's the one thing it's doing, and it's doing it by creating a folder called Amplify with a bunch of CloudFormation uh, stuff. And then it's also creating a stack in the cloud that with the roles and things that it needs so that when you create new serverless resources locally, it's gonna nest all those resources into this main Amplify stack in the cloud. Now, it asks you a couple of things. 
Um, so what IDE you're using, what language is this built on, so this is built on React. You can change default paths and build commands, I'm not gonna worry about that. And I'm gonna use my default uh, profile with the credentials that I already have in my machine to build all of this. Um, so this should take about a minute or two, probably just a minute. Let me show you uh, where I got this from. So if you Google AWS Amplify, you get to the documentation. You can go to Docs. You can see that it supports multiple platforms, JavaScript and native apps as well, and React Native. My app is obviously written in R React. And then you can see there are some instructions. So this is how you create a React app, <laughs> a new React app. You have to install the library locally, and I did this before uh, the demo, uh, and also add a specific library for React. Let me see if that's done. Okay, that's done. I'll show you then what I, what I keep doing. So um, now you go amplify add, and then you can start creating those serverless resources. So I'm going to choose auth, which is uh, the kind of code name for Cognito. Uh, I'm going to choose the default configuration. We're going to change that. And then amplify push is going to execute those changes in the cloud. So it's basically, it's going to create a new default Cognito user pool for me. All right? And while it does that, I'll show you everything else that I was showing you. So you saw me doing Amplify in it, and after the Amplify is initialized, then you get to add multiple things um, as you want. I hope that the size of this is good enough. Um, so if you wanna go for a specific authentication, for example, which is what I did, you can see that it's built on Cognito, um, and there's, here are the instructions. So this is what you saw me doing, and then pushing it. Now, um, I'm gonna start configuring my app so that it becomes, Cognito becomes the entry point of my, of my application. So I need to import the libraries into the entry point while the thing is being deployed in the cloud. Um, all right, so into my multi-tenant app, this is the entry point. So I'm just gonna import all those things and configuration. Um, you can see how Cognito also allows you to configure um, certain parameters within Cognito, so you're configuring the auth component that you're being imported. And as an example, I'm just gonna make one change. So I'm just gonna make mandatory sign-in. Cognito supports both unauthenticated users and authenticated users, so I just want this to default uh, my app to only look for authenticated users. All right, so, um, okay, so what is the way that we can get Cognito into our, into our app? We can, I can start using the components individually, sign-in, sign-up, but the easiest way to get away with it in, on a live demo so, and to show you all the other things that I want to show you is by using the with authenticator high order component. So you basically wrap this around your app and then Cognito becomes the entry point of the app. It's extremely simple, two lines of code. So I'm just gonna import it here. And then I just wrap it around my app. So I'm just gonna go down here at the bottom with authenticator. There you go. So that's done, but before testing it, there's something else that I need to change that is specific to my app, is at the moment I'm managing state based on basic auth, so I need to stop doing that. And now I need to start using Cognito for managing that stage. So I'm just gonna um, do this, which is basically just grabbing the token and using the component that I just imported in a method called current session. If that exists, it means that the user is signing, and then I can just go uh, users being uh, logged. That's all there is to it. And I'm just printing some stuff to the console and printing more stuff to the console related to, uh, to Cognito. All right, so this just finished right in time. Oh no, there's one more thing I need to do to my app. I need to get rid of that button, login button that I'm not gonna be using anymore. So you find that under the header. Yes, here you are. So I'm just gonna not display that button. Um, and, uh, and that's it, so let's test it. Should take uh, a couple of seconds. Provided it works. All right, so there you go. Welcome to my new app. So Cognito has become the, front, the, the entry point of my app. I'm gonna quickly create a new customer, so a, custom, a new user. I need to give it a strong password because I left the defaults. <laughs> this is a this is an actual email address, um, and this is not an actual phone number. 
All right, so then I get a code in my, uh, on my email. This is the challenge that I need to verify. I verify it. And then I've registered. So I can then sign in. And I am into my app. Obviously, this is a local. I'm running it locally. So none of these APIs are going to work yet because we still haven't built the rest of the app. And you can see here in the console how I printed the JWT token, which I'm actually going to show you very quickly, and the identity ID for the particular user. So if you go to jwt.io, you can grab that token that I show you, paste it there, and then it's going to tell you everything that's in it. So the email's been verified. This is the Cognito identity provider, et cetera. OK? All right, so that's good. I like the app. It's going to be the multi-tenant version of the app that we're transforming to. And I'm just going to push that and keep going with the session. I never know what button to press. There you go. OK. All right, so you've seen how easy it was for, to, for me to implement self-service sign up and sign in with Cognito. What this means for my developers is that we don't have to worry about manually provisioning environments anymore. So it's going to save a lot of time so that we can get faster at, at shipping features. I get the, the secure flows for, uh, for Cognito, um, giving me peace of mind. And finally, you saw how I integrated AWS Amplify with an existing app. So you can have a, a new app. You can create a new app or integrate it into an existing app. And, and I leveraged the libraries and the tool chain, not UI the, itself. The UI was from Cognito. OK, um, all right. So what do we do next? So we've done number one. We've done part of number two, because we consolidated the, the front end code base. Um, so we're going to start building the, the multi-tenant backend. And we're going to start with the scaffolding around it. So I'm going to build a new API. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to solve the security multi-tenant issue once and for all, and then abstract that complexity to developers so that they don't get to know all these things and they don't have to worry about security, uh, the security configuration. So I'm going to abstract that complexity. So there's three things I'm going to do in this second demo. First, we're standardizing the service offerings. So we're going to go from a hundreds of combinations of bespoke functionality into just two that kind of purposely map really well to customer one and customer two that I just showed you. <laughs> um, and in order to do that, uh, we need to create a custom attribute in Cognito so that that plan that the customer subscribed to is going to flow through in my JWT tokens to every microservice that I build. Secondly, we're going to do the first part of security, which is access control. There are multiple ways you can control access to Amazon API Gateway. Lambda authorizer is just one of those, and it's one that uses better token technologies like SAML or OAuth in the case of Cognito in order to validate whether the user can access the API or not. So this is the way it works. So a client sends a request to the API. A API Gateway is going to send that to uh, those tokens to Lambda authorizer, and Lambda authorizer is going to build a policy that is specific to that user. Optionally, it can also pass some context, and we're going to talk about that context later on. Now, if the policy is, is invalid or the permissions are denied, API Gateway is obviously going to reject that and not allow the customer to, to access certain API. Uh, but if the, if the policy is valid and the permissions are allowed, then a API Gateway is going to cache that over a TTL that is configurable and then allow the call through. Um, you can obviously. Um, um, you can obviously make that TTL zero if you want, but every time that a new user comes in, you don't have to hit Lambda every single time. So there's good, a good caching mechanism to improve performance. Now, remember that concept, context that is being built by the Lambda authorizer that I told you about? API Gateway, by default, sends that or pushes that to downstream calls in the back end. So I'm actually going to build something with this Lambda authorizer so that I pass all the information my microservices need about the tenant so that when my developers are building a new service, they get everything from the context. So they don't have to worry about Cognito and what configuration and what plan. Everything's going to be in the context for their microservices. So access control. That's the second thing we'll do. The third thing we'll do is, because we're moving to a, a, a multi-tenant platform, we're going to start uh, storing uh, the data into a multi-tenant database. 
Actually, there are gonna, there's, there's gonna be two of those, but we'll talk about that later on. Um, so, but because all of the users are gonna get access to the database, then I need to have a way to ensure that users can only access their own decks and their own scores and nobody else's. So the, the way we're gonna do this is by implementing a composite key strategy in DynamoDB in which we're prepending the user ID to every item on the table. And we're gonna combine that with a great feature for IAM that allows me to have a conditional access. So that condition is basically it's gonna look for who is this user and what is he trying to access. And if those things don't match, then the, the access are denied. So this is gonna enforce that users can only access their own information in the database. Okay, so to do this demo, I'm gonna show you two new tools. I show you Amplify and Demo 1. Demo 2, I'm gonna use the AWS Serverless Application Model, or SAM. Um, this is a higher level abstraction to CloudFormation um, that, uh, that supports everything that CloudFormation does, but it gives you a very simplified syntax to define um, Lambda functions, API gateway, and DynamoDB tables. So you're saving time, again, saving time and so that we can unlock some speed uh, by using SAM. Um, and the second, the second tool that I use is related to SAM, but, but different, <laughs> is the SAM CLI. So before the SAM CLI, if you wanted to test Lambda functions locally, you couldn't. You just had to upload the version of your Lambda function to the cloud, wait for about I don't know, 20, 30 seconds, and then test it. And this is not great. So if you're a developer, uh, you, you, when you're in the zone, author testing and debugging code, you, wanna be, you want the, the test to be that fast. You don't want to get out of the zone and wait for the Lambda to deploy. So some CLI achieves that by mocking the Lambda execution environment using a container. So we're gonna be using the SAM CLI so that we can have a tight loop of author and test and debug. We can test Lambda functions locally before deploying, again, giving you developers more speed when you're, uh, when you're working on serverless applications. Now, these are some of the things that you can do with SAM CLI. You can create an app, you can invoke Lambda locally, you can mock API Gateway or the Lambda endpoint. Mocking the Lambda endpoint is great because it means that you, ha you have on your machine a Lambda endpoint that you can run your test against. So the same test that you run as part of your CI CD process, now you can run locally. But obviously I'm only gonna use one of those when I show you during the demo because we have multiple things to do. So let's do it. Okay, so this finished deploying. Let me go to my demo to commands because this helps me memorize things. Now, uh, this is a level 400 session, so you've seen me using Amplify for creating the cloud formation that it spits out Cognito. And now I'm gonna be using Sam using another template. So those things are separate. That's something that I, by choice, made for this demo. But it also means that I need to tell my new template about the Cognito that I created before. So I am going to quickly um, do that. So I'm just looking up what the Cognito identity pool ID is that I created, and I just briefly need to save it here, and then I'll run you through all the templates that I'm creating. Just bear with me. All right, so that's done. All right, I'm gonna show you this template after I deploy it, because it takes about, I don't know, a minute or two. So the SAM template that I'm deploying um, is this. So you can see how I need to define that this is written in SAM syntax, and you do that with this transform. After you've done that, then you can define all of the resources that you normally would using CloudFormation um, under the resources uh, section. Now, you can use and you can combine CloudFormation syntax with SAM syntax. So if any, any service that is a type AWS something else that is not serverless, that is using CloudFormation syntax. But if you see something that is using AWS serverless, that is using SAM syntax. So as you can see, I'm just creating a role for Lambda. Um, this is the simplified way that SAMs al SAM allows you to create Lambda functions. So there's a couple of optional, uh, sorry, mandatory uh, properties like runtime and handler. And there's a bunch of optional properties like uh, function name and the role if you wanna give it a role and environment variables. But you, you can see a handful of line of codes and you have a Lambda, Lambda function. I'm also creating a course function, and this is just for those that, who know, just for the internet to work. <laughs> um, I'm creating a, a REST API using uh, CloudFormation syntax. 
then defining the, the plan authorizer, which is going to be my, my lambda function, the authorizer. And you can see that I point to it here. Um, and then just two permissions, permissions for those two lambda functions that I'm creating. Remember, this is just a scaffolding. So there's only two lambda functions and the API itself. All right, so that deployed well. Um, uh, let, me show you the, let me show you the Lambda authorizer very quickly. OK, so this is a Lambda authorizer. Um, AWS provides you with this module so that it be becomes easier for your Lambda function to behave like a, like a Lambda authorizer. Um, and, the way, and then you define whatever logic you want to allow customers in. So I did it using the plans that we talked about. So bronze plan allows you to hit these APIs. Silver allows you to hit these APIs. Um, so the way this is working is I'm just grabbing the JWT and decoding it. After I've decoded, I make some calls to load the credentials. Um, and I'll show you that later. But basically, I'm making calls to Cognito. If those calls are successful, it means that my token is valid. If it's not valid, then this function ends here, and I return not authorized. But if it's valid, I keep doing the things that I need to do, which is building a policy, and optionally, building uh, the context that I'm going to pass downstream for this particular user. And that's what the rest of the, the, this is doing, basically. Building the policy based on the plan. You can see that there's a load credentials and initialized policy that I have below. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail of this code. This is probably the most comp the slightly more complex function in, the whole, in all the demos today. But this is how you initialize the policy. There are snippets of this in our documentation. Um, and then this is one, one way that I'm using the AWS SDK to get the Cognito identity ID, because this is something that I embed on that, on that, on that, in that context. So it's somewhat easier. You get a lot of snippets from us. Um, OK, so that's the Lambda authorizer. What if I want to test it locally? Because I'm just coming up with the I'm authoring, and I want to test it locally. So you can use the SAM CLI. So let me show you a couple of things that you can do with the SAM CLI. Uh, you can obviously check the version that you have installed. Uh, you can validate the SAM template. Uh, and this is something that you should do before deploying, not like I did. Um, um, and, and also as part of your CI-CD process. You should do that locally and, and as part of your CI-CD process, not the same way that you would with CloudFormation. OK, so I am now going to show you one of the features of the SAM CLI, and the only one that I'll show you, because I'm running out of time, um, SAM local invoke. Basically, you invoke Lambda locally. You need to give it the name as defined in the SAM template, and then you need to pass it the uh, event source that is triggering that. For this particular Lambda function, I need to give it a JSON token. So what I did is I have this JSON token here. I'm going to save it there. And now I can SAM local invoke. I'm going to use another terminal, and <laughs> you'll see why. Um, I, I want to be able to copy all the big JSON object that comes out of it. And for some reason, in, in Visual Studio, I was getting the thing, the lines cut out. And I know that some of you know the solution to that, but I just didn't. Um, so you, I just copy this. This is the output of my Lambda function executing locally. I'm going to paste it here and beautify it a little bit. There you go. So you can see that I've, I'm returning a principal ID with a policy document that is basically giving access to this user to create, to get, and to game. Um, and I'm building the context. And I probably shouldn't show you the access keys. But anyway, there are the access keys. And I'm just closing this really quickly. So that's the context that, uh, that we've created for this particular user. Now, the permissions for the user are very limited. Um, so that's not a problem. Now, so we have access control ready. And now we're going to do data partitioning. For data partitioning, I'll do, I'm going to create policies, attach that policy to the authenticated users for Cognito. And then I'm going to upgrade the, uh, I'll, I'll show you everything that, that I'm doing here. But I'm just creating the two policies. Um, um, the policies are, this is the policy that you saw before in the slide with a little, a little, bit, a little bit more meat in it. So I'm allowing these actions again Dynamo on these two resources that I haven't created yet, but I will. They're going to be called Dex Master and Games Master, the two databases for the multi-tenant backend. And this is the magic condition that I told you about that is going to enforce data partitioning for me. The other one is just a, just a standard policy for, for Cognito authenticated users. 
And finally, you saw me running the script. What this script is doing is grabbing some information up there and then just attaching that to the role of uh, the authenticated user for Cognito. Then I am creating the custom attribute that I told you about, and I'm doing it with custom attribute here uh, called plan. And then I'm making that plan silver for customer one and bronze for customer two, and I do it with these two, with these two lines. Okay, so it's uh, very simple. Obviously, this is a, a consequence of having created a, a Cognito separate from my SAM template. Otherwise, it would I wouldn't have needed to use the CLI. Okay, so once that's done, I'm just I just need need to make one more change to my front end application because I needed to point to the API that I just recently created. So I'm just going to look up what is the API endpoint for it. And then I am going to embed that into the app. And I think I have that in main body. Yes, main body. OK, so it goes here. And then I can hide that, which I was using to dynamically point to my monolith. OK. So that's all there is to it. I'm going to deploy this change. And now I have the scaffolding. I have my app pointing to the scaffolding. And then in demo three, I'm going to start creating this, the, the microservices um, that are going to bring everything home. All right. So let's go back to my slides. All right. So you've seen uh, in demo two how such a good match OpenID Connect and SaaS make. Because you can, again, in a lightweight and secure way, pass tenant, in, 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 tenant context to downstream services. You've seen how SAM gives me speed because it gives me, uh, I write a lot less code, so I, I can define those serverless resources a lot quicker. Um, you can see that security should always be a, a top priority, and you should definitely solve that well. And after you've solved that, <coughs> Think about abstracting that complexity from the developer in sim so to simplify the way that they go about creating software. And this is important if you want to maintain speed. I did it in this demo through the context that my Lambda authorization is creating an API is passing downstream. But you can do it in multiple ways. You can have a, a, a module or a, or a helper library in, in your code. And finally, I get to author, test, and debug in a tight loop. You saw me test, uh, executing Lambda locally, and that also gives you development speed when you're working on serverless applications. All right, so demo three. We're going to finally start uh, breaking the monolith and building those microservices. So this is what we're going to do. Um, we're going to start building all those microservices. Now, I have purposely <laughs> made this on the functional side of things very easy. So both pieces are written in Node.js, um, in the monolith, all those functions are already defined. So I need to change some syntax, but actually breaking the monolith is going to be easy on the functional side of things. That is not the case on the data side of things. So those two new services for DEX and scores, they do not exist, so I need to create them from scratch. And the reason I'm doing that is because one principle of microservices, and arguably one of the hardest to do, is to have independent data stores. So the old notion of having a single source of truth with all your data being accessed from anywhere directly is not good enough for speed. So we want our database, our, our data stores, to be independent, owned by a single microservice and a single team, and exposing that functionality over an API. And that's why I'm creating those two. So breaking the monolith on the data side of things is not going to be that straightforward. Let me show you what we're going to do. So at the moment, this is the structure of all of our monolith data stores. You have the odd credentials there, <laughs> and you also have cards information and score information in each one of those. So we know that the credentials are now moved into Cognito, so we don't need to worry about storing credentials anymore. And what we're going to do is we're going to create uh, their own functional multi-tenant data stores, and that way they'll be easier to manage, easier to, uh, easier to scale, and, and more cost-optimized. So notice how we are embedding the user ID or prepending the user ID into the partition key for every item on the table. This is what is going to allow me to enforce the data partitioning that I could previously configured. So let's go for demo three. OK, so this has been deployed. Um, demo three. OK, so before I start with demo three, I want to show you uh, what I currently have. So I'm going to go to the, so the existing app. Um, 
Welcome to new app. Okay, so this is the new version of my app that is being served out of that domain. I'm going to sign in as customer1. All right, there you go. Um, obviously, nothing's going to work because I haven't deployed the microservices yet. Um, and let me show you uh, customer2. I'm just going to close all this. Customer two. Oh yeah, right, that's another password. Um, so I need to reset the password because I created this with the CLI. Um, I'm just gonna give it, don't tell anyone, the same password that I gave customer one. And there you go. So you can see that it's uh, working is working uh, on the, the new apps, obviously, without access to any other uh, backend APIs yet. All right, so I'm gonna deploy the, new, the two DynamoDBs that you saw before, and for that I'm just gonna run the script and then show you. So this is another SAM template. SAM is really flexible. Um, so I'll show you the template. For DynamoDBs, SAM gives you a simplified syntax in the, using serverless. And there's two versions of that, the normal table and then the simple table. Simple table means you don't have a sort key, it's just a partition key. So I'm defining it here and giving it a name. That's one of the tables and this is the other one of the tables. Um, let me show you the script that I'm running to deploy Dynamos. And by the way, I didn't show you the script that I used to deploy before, but it's exactly the same. So all I'm doing is SAM package and SAM deploy. So these are two commands from the CLI that make it really easy for me to package so not only execute changes against CloudFormation if I'm adding new functions or adding stuff to my SAM template, but it also packages all the artifacts of your code and deploy the changes of, on Lambda. So you're doing the two things with these two commands, again, giving me as a developer more speed when I wanna work and release changes to my, to my serverless applications. All right, so those are the two that I run. Um, let me show you the functions. Um, I'm gonna show you just two of the, of the ones that I broke out of the monolith. Um, so let me open a monolith, a simple one. So I'm just gonna go with get. Um, components, oh, so this is the front end and it in the back end. All right, so get. So that, that is a get function from the monolith. And let me show you the get function for the, oh, let's create, get. All right. So hopefully, um, let me see, try to see if I can, yeah, okay. So you can see that they're slightly different, but the differences are very subtle. So I'm using, in both, I'm using uh, some libraries, um, and this is a helper, actually, uh, that I use uh, to, uh, for data access. And here, um, I need a handler in, in my Lambda, and I'm also using a helper. So this helper is a way for me to abstract the complexity of accessing those backend, the new data access microservices. So my developer don't have to think about it. And all I'm doing in these two requests is get the, dan the name from the, from, the, from the query pram. Here it is the same. Then I'm getting the, da the deck from data access by using one of the methods that has been exposed by the helper. Um, same here, it's just a different helper. And finally, returning it. So because it, um, this is a service and I just return it in, a, in, a, in the monolith, here I need to call back uh, the, the, the callback in the function. So not rocket science, they're both really similar. What's more interesting about this demo is breaking the data, uh, the data monoliths. So let me deploy the SAM template for three, which is just an update adding all the functions and I'll show you, of course. So while that happens, uh, this, is the, this is the updates that I make. So this role you've already seen, and I've created, I'm creating six Lambda functions. So for the four services that are accessible through the API, and the two for the data access ones. So you got data access function, you got games, create, get, shuffle, and game function. These two you've already seen. So you've seen the authorizer and course. Um, now I need to actually do a lot more because I need on my API to create a deployment and also create the, the, the methods that, are, that I'm gonna be uh, accessing now. So for those four Lambda functions that I'm creating that are accessible through the API, um, I need to create the API resource, the API method, um, the permission for, for the Lambda function, and also the options, uh, this is for cores, again, for the internet to work. 
<laughs> so, uh, and I do that for every single one. So every single one of the four that I'm creating. So you can inspect this code, but you can see how it's very repetitive what I'm doing. Okay, now we're gonna migrate the data. So let me show you what we currently have. So at the moment, I have the monolith for customer one. There's a bunch of data in it, some decks with some names, there's cards. This is an attribute that I'm using as part of the code just to make it ugly. <laughs> scores and the odd username and very insecure password. Um, it's the same for data customer two. So you can see there's a bunch of cards. Some of the decks have scores, some don't. Um, and then I have the two multi-tenant that I just recently created and there's nothing in them, okay? So what I'm gonna do to migrate is I'm gonna run a script and I'll show you the script. So I created this data migration script, which is basically importing the SDK, initializing DynamoDB, and then grabbing those two query params about the identity ID for user one and user two, and executing this function twice for customer one and customer two. So I'm scanning the database and I'm allowed to do that because the database is pretty small, so I can just scan it. If you have a massive database and you're gonna have to have a, a batching mechanism so that you don't overflow your, uh, um, your, uh, your DynamoDB table, or you can increase capacity for Dynamo and it can still work. Then I iterate over all the items that I have. If I find the word deck, then I replace the word deck for the user ID that I'm getting out of the, out of the, um, out of the token, yeah? Um, and then I'm putting all of that to the new master database. If a scores exists within that item, then I do exactly the same, prepending the user ID and putting that to the new database. So this is extremely simple migration um, script. Now for the migration script to work, I need I need this user ID. So this is customer what? Uh, this is customer, I don't know what customer is this. I think this is customer two. So let me just do that. And customer one I had it here I believe, yes. So identity ID for customer one. Hopefully this, I, don't, I didn't make a mistake. So let's, let's see. Boom. So everything seems to have gone well. Um, let me go to Dynamo and refresh. You can see now that I have a bunch of decks in my games master referring to two different users. So you can see how this one ends in F2 and this one ends, ends in 0F and the scores, only the scores. So single purpose uh, data store. And the decks master, same thing. I have a, a couple more items, but the migration worked. So now that the migration work and that the APIs are up, I can show you the app. So let's see if, um, there may be some, some cold starts here, because um, um, I'm basically doing this for the first time after deploying the lambdas. So I can get the deck, I can play a game after cold starts, <laughs> and I can also shuffle, shuffle the deck. <clears throat> so you can see that now uh, everything, everything is working. I can, to show you that the thing migrated well, I can try to access deck two before creating it. So let me go get two. And this is uh, retrieving the get two. Did, did that work? Let me just try another one. Uh, customer one, okay, they both have three. So I'm just gonna go with three. Hmm, awkward. Okay, three, good. Okay, and it's not working. It failed to load resources and respond with the status. Anyway, I'll fix that later. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, one more thing that I can try is seeing if the um, seeing if, the, if customer two can access the shuffle function. So I'm gonna do that uh, here with Insomnia. So I'm gonna grab the output value, and then I'm gonna hit the API in another way, not using the main, uh, the main um, the, the app. So I'm just gonna hit the API, going for get, although if the demo, if the, if the demo failed before, I don't know if this is gonna work. So let me just grab the token for 
customer one. Yes. I'm going to drop the token here. So I'm just basically trying to access deck one for customer one. You can see that it retrieved uh, the deck one. Um, if I try shuffle, yes, customer one al is allowed to shuffle. But if I tried customer two, if I use the customer two token, um, it should fail. So let's do that. I'm going to try to shuffle deck one for customer two. Access denied. So this is good. It means that uh, data access is actually working properly. OK, so that's the end of demo three. Let's go back to the slides. Wow, and I'm running out of time. So, um, so you've seen how microservices, or we've implemented microservices, and we took the hard decision of actually breaking those database monolith. Um, and this way, our applications are going to be faster to develop, which is the whole theme of today. I'm freeing up engineering time so that they can focus on what they need um, in bu building those business functions. Um, you've seen how we use serverless. Um, we had a few issues then. But, uh, but serverless, I, I am really passionate about serverless. I believe they're the future of application development. So I encourage you all to join the revolution. So we've achieved it all. So we have now a secure, efficient, and scalable multi-tenant SaaS application. Uh, we've consolidated the, the code bases into the best versions of them. Um, and, now, and now our developers can go really fast. Can they? Our CEO is a bit skeptical about that. So this is going to be trial by fire. The CEO wants me to release a new cut service. Um, and not only that, he wants, he wants to create a new uh, service offering, which is gold. If, we, if we're really fast, we're going to be able to do that in a couple of minutes. So let's do it. Um, I'll, I'll focus on this demo on the front end. So I'll add the button to the front end. I add the method to the API. I'm going to create the plan in the Lambda authorizer and finally release the card service. I need to press this button. All right, so let's do it. So demo four is, all right, so I'm going to add the card button to the API, to the to the multi, the multi tenant app. And if you do that here under controls, so I'm just going to bind this here. I need to create a new case by which I allow shuffle if the plan is either silver or gold. And I need to have a now a new case for gold that allows uh, for cut. Yeah? And I need to do one more thing. I actually need to display the button. So. That's it. That's all there is to it. So now my app has a new button. How quick was that? I'm going to deploy that. And while it deploys, I'll show you, because I'm running out of time, I literally have seven minutes. I'm just going to go, um, I'm going to deploy the SAM template as well. And then I'll show you. So while that deploys, I'll show you the template. All I did was I've hidden everything that you've already seen. Uh, and then this is the new cut. There's one more here. So this is the new cut service function, which is exactly the same like the others, pointing to obviously another, another handler. Um, and here are the four things that are needed to be accessible from, from the API. So the resource, the method, um, the permission, and course. Okay. Um, all right, so let's close this. Um, let me show you briefly the function itself. So cut. Very similar to the one we've seen before. I'm getting the name from the, from the query string. I am getting the deck accessing the data access uh, service that we created before. I am, and this is how I cut the deck. So I basically grab a random number, and I cut the deck somewhere. This is going to be easy to see for decks that are perfectly ordered. And then I return the deck. So very, very straightforward. OK, Okay. so while that finishes, let me see if this finished. OK, so I need to upgrade customer one to gold so that we can get access to the, to the we can see the function at work. So I'm just going to go ID here and there. And then I am, in these two commands, I'm just making customer one uh, gold. And I am signing customer one out so that we generate new tokens when I sign in. And that's it. So let me see if the API has deployed. Deployed. So now I can test it. 
All right, so customer one. This is interesting. This is probably what caused the previous error. Um, let me just refresh until I get a, a new app. Is this customer one? I'm going to go with a. Mm, these sessions are breaking my demo. So let's go to Firefox. There's a, React does a lot of caching, and I think that's the reason why it sometimes uh, doesn't help me. So customer one with my password. There you go. Boom. So we have a new cut button. If I get, let's get the get uh, the deck number one. That deploy. Ah, that's really a shame. So the API seemed to have deployed. A uh, network error when attempting to fetch the resource. Hmm. So I'm not going to be able to go with glory from here because something broke in the API. <laughs> All right, so let's finish this off. Um, okay. So, all right, so you've seen how the whole purpose of today's talk was simplifying operations so that we can free up engineering time so they can focus on what really matters, which is pushing those features fast to your users. Security, arguably with multi-tenant SaaS applications, is hard. And you need to solve it. And you need to solve it uh, well in the beginning. So a good place to start is using an OpenID Connect uh, identity provider and managing uh, the tenant context using these uh, JWT tokens. After you've solved the security components of your multi-tenant SaaS, then you need to think about the developer's experience. So abstract the complexity from them. You can do it by either, uh, for example, creating the modules and the helpers so that they don't have to deal with interacting with Cognito on your behalf, um, or the way that I did it, which is pushing the context uh, to the downstream resources. Uh, serverless microservices, of course, uh, there's no, uh, there's a um, great way to get more scale and more speed into your development. And finally, we're all builders, so we know that it's important to use the right tool for the right job. You've seen at work uh, three tools today, AWS Amplify, AWS SAM, a serverless application model, and the SAM CLI, all of which not only speed up development for you, but also allow you to manage more complex environments at scale using the proper tools, okay? As promised, there's the repo. Uh, you can go and, and try this at home if you want, and some other resources. Um, you'll get access to the video of this session again um, on, in YouTube. Thank you for attending. Please don't forget to, to rate the session and leave your feedback in the mobile app. It is really important. I read every single one of those comments. Um, I am very lucky to be able to share my passions with you. I hope you learned something today and that you're feeling now empowered to go back to work so that you can do some downhill mountain biking with your application so you can get more development speed with safety. Thank you.